You know Wyatt Earp, gambling gunslinger, lawless lawman, and the hero of the OK Corral. But much of his biography was embellished, largely by Earp himself. That means Earp's life story is literally the stuff of Wild West legend. This is the story of his incredible life. Born on March 19, 1848, Wyatt Earp seemed to have 50 different fathers all rolled into one. As author Alan Barra laid out, Wyatt's father Nick worked as a farmer, storekeeper, constable, judge, justice of the peace, and law-breaking bootlegger. He also recruited and drilled Union soldiers during the Civil War. A 19th century nomad, Nick dragged the family from city to city for various reasons. By the mid to late 1850s, Wyatt and his brothers James and Virgil had lived in seven different homes. A 13-year-old Wyatt would attempt his own journey after the Civil War broke out. He detested family work and ran away from home in hopes of fighting like his two oldest brothers and half-brother. Wyatt apparently ran into his father at the recruiting office, ending his not-so-great escape from the doldrums of hoeing corn. In late 1869, a 21-year-old Wyatt Earp met Eurilla Sutherland. Just after Earp turned 22, they exchanged wedding vows with Earp's father officiating the ceremony. As detailed in the biography Inventing Wyatt Earp, by 1870, Eurilla was pregnant and Earp was constable of Lamar, Missouri, a place that had no jail and where his father worked as a justice of the peace. Whatever hopes Wyatt had for their future died with his wife and child, possibly during labor. It was at that time that Earp embraced his inner outlaw. In 1871, he, John Schoen, and Edward Kennedy allegedly stole two horses. However, Schoen's wife claimed that Earp and Kennedy got Schoen drunk to recruit him for the horse heist. She further alleged that they threatened to kill Schoen if he incriminated them in court. Guilty or not, Earp escaped and never faced justice after his arrest. Earp started his law career in Kansas as an accused criminal. After the horse thievery charge, he absconded to Wichita, where his brother James lived. There, Wyatt provided security for saloons and later got hired as a policeman. An intimidating figure, he excelled at pistol-whipping criminals and whipping them in fistfights. His cop buddy, Bat Masterson, remarked that there were few men in the West who could whip Earp in a rough-and-tumble fight. You gonna do something or just stand there and bleed? Earp got fired for winning one such fight with William Smith, a candidate for Marshall who made the grave mistake of insulting the incumbent, aka Earp's boss. The once more unemployed Earp relocated to Dodge City. Per the Dodge City Daily Globe, he worked seasonally as an assistant marshal or deputy for several years, where he maintained order but seemed less concerned about upholding the law. He allowed illegal drinking and prostitution, imposing fines to profit off the crime instead of stopping it outright. Author Lawrence Yadun noted that detractors referred to Wyatt and Bat Masterson as the fighting pimps because of, quote, their affinity for prostitutes and other women of questionable morality. Roger J. observed that in 1872, Wyatt Earp resided at a brothel in Peoria, Illinois. He and his brother Morgan would be arrested there during a February raid. Three months later, they were arrested at a different brothel, this time at the antiseptic-sounding McClellan Institute. A court might have found Wyatt guilty of pimping because he and Morgan each received hefty fines of $44.55. Later that same year, Wyatt was arrested again, this time on a gunboat said to be occupied by pimps and prostitutes. And once again, he got slapped with a pimp-sized fine. Goddamn pimps! Doc Holliday may have been the greatest poster child for those living with tuberculosis. Wyatt Earp said of Holiday, Although he sometimes drank three quarts of whiskey a day, he was still the most skillful gambler and the nerviest, fastest, deadliest man with a six-gun I ever saw. Don't mind if I do. <coughs> Kinder words have probably never been said about a dentist, but tales of Holiday's lethal aim were massive exaggerations invented to protect him from robbers and ruffians. He was a thin, sickly man who lost his mother to TB at 15. When he was later diagnosed with the disease himself, the development torpedoed his life as a professional mouth mangler. Instead, he mouthed off at people as a gambler, traveling out west in hopes that the climate would keep his TB at bay. Regardless, the Encyclopedia of the Great Plains claims that Holiday was, quote, not a bluff. The Georgia-born gentleman engaged in duels to protect his honor, and his fighting spirit would lead him to Earp. Sources differ on where the legendary friends first crossed paths. Some say that Holiday became acquainted with Earp in Dodge City, Kansas, while dodging murder charges. Others, like author Chuck Hornung, have asserted that they met in Texas. 
According to that account, Holiday had beaten a gambler named Henry Kahn with a cane, and Kahn shot him. Looking to recover, he traveled about, encountering Earp in Fort Griffin. In 1879, Wyatt Earp and his brothers, Virgil and James, arrived in the boom town of Tombstone, Arizona, later followed by their older brother Morgan and Doc Holliday. Professor Douglas Linder described Tombstone as being, quote, wild even by the standards of the Wild West. It was dubbed the town too tough to die, and according to History.net, it, quote, had no law except that of the gun and knife. Or, as author Frederick Bechdolt put it, Tombstone had a man for breakfast every morning, and there were mornings when the number ran as high as half a dozen. When you think about famous Wild West rivalries, the Earp Brothers and Doc Holliday clashing with the Clantons and McClory's, and Tombstone probably tops the list. But Wyatt Earp was a multitasker where feuds were concerned. In addition to outlaws, he also fought the law, and one lawman in particular. Johnny Bean had two things that Earp wanted badly. Bean was sheriff, and Bean had lived with a woman named Josephine, and Earp wanted both. Earp wooed Josephine, and they would spend the better part of five decades together. His bid for sheriff didn't go nearly as well. Some of history's most famous bullets flew during the 1881 gunfight at the OK Corral when brothers Wyatt, Virgil, and Morgan Earp, along with Doc Holliday, battled cowboys Billy Clanton and Tom and Frank McClory in an empty lot. Two other cowboys, Ike Clanton and Billy Claiborne, reportedly ran when the shooting began. There were multiple sources of animosity between the groups. For instance, the cowboys allegedly viewed Virgil, who was a marshal in Tombstone, as an illegitimate lawman because of the dubious way he enforced the law. But the gunfight was also steeped in deep-seated hostility over the Civil War. The OK Corral claimed the lives of the McClory brothers and Billy Clanton. Holiday and the Earps stood trial for murder but were acquitted. However, the bad blood between the cowboys and the Earps was far from over. Dodge City author Tom Calvin described Wyatt Earp's love life as being pretty complicated. Four different women identified themselves as his wife over the course of his life, and apparently he never divorced any of them. Then again, writer Roger Jay has pointed out that there's no solid proof that he ever actually married most of them either. After his first love, Eurilla, next came Sally Heckle, though some evidence suggests her name was Sally Haspel. Regardless, she was a prostitute who got busted alongside Earp on a gunboat. She further complicated things when she identified herself to authorities as Sarah Earp. Why it could have actually been her pimp or protector, but whatever the case, they were close enough that Sally likely followed him to Dodge City. Unfortunately for her, Earp fell in love with Maddie Blaylock. As Legends of America detailed, Maddie was a prostitute who became Earp's common-law wife. Sally moved on, and Earp went on to break Maddie's heart by abandoning her for his fourth wife, Josephine, a.k.a. Johnny Bean's former fiancé. In 1882, Wyatt Earp, his brother Morgan, and Doc Holliday were shooting pool when a different kind of shooting interrupted them. Per history net, two bullets were fired. One narrowly missed Wyatt, the other didn't miss Morgan. Believing the Cowboys killed Morgan in retaliation for the OK Corral, Wyatt let a vendetta ride and started executing Cowboys. Now a wanted man, he left Arizona and traveled throughout the West, eventually settling in California, where he established himself in West Coast boxing circles. A longtime boxing fan, Earp received training from a pro fighter as a teenager and later refereed fights. In 1896, he was chosen to referee the heavyweight championship bout between Tom Sharkey and Bob Fitzsimmons in San Francisco. Rumors circulated that Earp agreed to hand Sharkey the victory. The fight started bizarrely when Earp entered the ring with a gun under his coat that had to be confiscated. Fitzsimmons bested Sharkey throughout the bout and floored him in the eighth round with a wicked gut punch, but Earp declared it a low blow and disqualified Fitzsimmons. Earp was branded a dirty referee but again dodged a legal bullet. Because boxing was illegal in San Francisco, he couldn't be tried for fight fixing. Wyatt Earp spent the end of the 19th century trying to strike gold. He ran a saloon in Alaska during its gold rush and then rushed to Nevada in 1901 in search of more gold there. He eventually moved to Los Angeles where he would have a striking influence on the golden age of Hollywood. Earp became an unpaid technical advisor for Hollywood westerns and befriended two of the silent era's biggest stars, William Hart and Tom Mix. Per a Wyatt Earp anthology, Earp and Mix bonded over Shakespeare and Wyatt compared his life to Hamlet. He ought not to be. That is the question. But that's where the similarities ended. According to Earp, that feller Hamlet was a talkative man. He wouldn't have lasted long in Kansas. 
Earp himself, no speaker of Elizabethan English, might have talked more like the Duke John Wayne. Or rather, John Wayne might have talked like Wyatt Earp. It's been reported that Wayne modeled his on-screen persona after Earp, whom he allegedly got to know personally. The actor was quoted as saying, Earp was the man who had actually done the things in his life that I was trying to do in a movie. I imitated his walk, I imitated his talk. However, the American cowboy disputed this narrative, arguing that Wayne instead got his knowledge from director John Ford, who worked with Earp. We became quite friendly, and I didn't know anything about the OK Corral at the time. Pop culture often paints Wyatt Earp as a guy who talked sternly and carried a big gun. A very, very big gun. That's my butt line you're wearing, isn't it? I guess it is. Dubbed the Buntline Special, Earp's weapon was said to be one of five custom-made Colt revolvers that writer Ned Buntline supposedly bestowed on five of the West's greatest gunslingers, all of them lawmen. The long firearms of the law reportedly had 12-inch barrels and the name Ned engraved on their grips. It seems fitting that as an icon of the Wild West, Earp would own the Conestoga of smoke wagons. But was Buntline blowing smoke when he boasted about handing Earp this specially made gun? In 1876, Colt rolled out a line of long revolvers, but no footlong version existed until 1957 when Colt sought to profit off of Earp's posthumous popularity. Only 30 or so original revolvers existed, and there's no evidence that Ned Buntline ever ordered one. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite historical figures are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.